Look, if you're going to go into space and you're going to stay, um, you've got to lower the costs. And, and the best way to lower the costs is to learn to live off the land. Living off the land means learning how to use the resources of space to do the things you want to do. In other words, when the pioneers in other places moved into a forested area, they chopped down some trees and they built log cabins, or they made bricks out of the mud that they found there and they built their houses. Um, they learned to, to power their stoves by using the local materials they had and, and to cook their food using you know, wood and coal and things they found where they were. If we're, going to do, uh, if we're going to create settlements in space, we've got to do the same thing there. In situ resource utilization is what it's called. It means using the resources you find where you are. And um, it is absolutely one of the most important things we're going to have to do in space. You've got to live off the land. You can't be carrying your supplies up to all the time. You know, I have um, some great images that I use when I talk of uh, log cabins and uh, sod cabins, which in, in the Great Plains they used to cut out chunks of grass and mud and stack them up and make their cabins. And what, in one of the great pictures I have, there's a, a family sitting out in front of their sod cabin. And they're all standing there, posed in that 1800s fashion, looking all very stiff and proud. And interestingly, right next to them is a rocking chair, very nice, ornate rocking chair. Nobody's sitting in that rocking chair. Why is that rocking chair out there? The rocking chair is sitting there because that's a manufactured item. It showed that they were wealthy. It showed that they had enough money to own a rocking chair, which had to be imported by them from the, from back east. It's, and why is that important? Why does that show wealth? Because it was so expensive to bring something like that out there. You need to learn as quickly as you can to make as much as you can from where you are. That lowers your costs, that allows you to survive, and that begins to reduce your dependence on the people back home. The Mars Society has an excellent analog uh, of, a, of a Mars station uh, near Greenland. Uh, that in fact our organization uh, that I was working with at the time called Fines gave them the first hundred thousand dollars to to build, and um, we thought it was a great uh, a great thing to fund because they could practice what it was like to live on Mars. Not so much that they're breathing Martian air or anything like that, but they're beginning to learn how to uh, interact with each other, to live in an isolated environment, to interact with that isolated and hostile environment. Uh, over a long period of time and also because it, it uh, fires the imagination because people can look at that and say you know that that's cool that's what it might be like to live on Mars and that, that, that's something you want to do you want to get people excited and anything you can do anytime uh, to excite people uh, about space it's really important um, I don't care whether it's the moon Mars the asteroids or free space or whatever it is I don't care if it's the oceans of Europa it, it really doesn't matter to me where somebody wants to go what matters to me is that we do go, and that we go with the idea of staying. Um, I think it's very, very important that the next generation that's getting involved in space and leading the way into space uh, make it exciting. Um, the last couple of generations that have been working in space, uh, especially in the government side, have done their very best to make it incredibly dull and boring. Um, and I think there's been a cost to that. It's, it's a risky business. The idea that we can make space super safe is an oxymoron when you're dealing with a frontier. Whenever you're on the edge, whenever you put yourself at risk and you succeed, you are no more alive than in that moment. I believe it's the same for cultures as it is for the individual person. I believe that a culture that is moving itself out to the edge, that is going out beyond the edge, experiencing the edge and doing so successfully, is a culture that's very alive. And it's only when you pull back from that and you try and pretend that everything is safe, everything must be perfectly safe, we can't take any risks, that you begin to die as a culture. So space has to be exciting. Space needs to be exciting. And uh, you should always do what you can to, to find the excitement and create the excitement. Some 20 to 30 years after the beginning of the frontier movement, we're starting to see the arrival on the scene of uh, financial institutions and wealthy individuals who want to participate and help fund the opening of the frontier. It's an exciting time. It has taken a lot of failures and some successes to begin to draw their attention. 
I think part of that has started to happen because we've seen some very, very wealthy individuals start to put their own money into it. And there's a real me too factor. You know, it's interesting, I, I live in LA, I live very near Hollywood, and the joke in Hollywood is that uh, everybody in Hollywood wants to uh, produce a movie uh, based on an already successful idea. Um, you know, they want to be the, the first to do something that everybody's done. And that's why you always see all these kind of movies that are very similar come out one after the other. Um, well, having seen people come and go in this field in, in different, uh, different guises and with different projects over the years, we're starting to see some getting close to success. And we're, again, starting to see people with some wealth put their own money in and get involved. Um, the financial community that's now coming in, into the space field is uh, much more conservative than that we've seen in the past, and they're demanding a lot more from the people who are starting space businesses. You really have to have a serious business plan. You really have to be able to show how you're gonna make money, what market niche you're gonna serve, um, that kind of thing, what your product's gonna do. You have to be able to demonstrate a strong team, et cetera, et cetera. So in other words, they're starting to treat space like a real business. Oh no. Now we have to act like real business people. Now there's sometimes an attitude out there, um, you know, especially on campus, things like that, that, oh God, business is evil, et cetera, et cetera. You know, business can be evil. Business without morals can be evil, but anything without morals can be evil. If we move into space the right way and with the right attitude and the right morality, the businesses that move into space, the commercial interests that move into space uh, can help us fund the breakout of humanity into this new domain and do so maybe with a little bit more class than we've done it before, with a little bit more taste. Um, sometimes we hear about things like billboards in space. Oh my God, we're going to go into space and build billboards. I don't think it's going to happen that way. I think that um, we're going to be able to try and keep space uh, an environment that uh, is beautiful and exciting and yet still create activities that are profitable um, and make money so that we can stay. Nobody stays until somebody pays. It can be a taxpayer or it can be a customer. In the past, um, almost throughout history, moves into new frontiers have been characterized by uh, interactions between governments, um, often competitive interactions between governments, sometimes predatory interactions between governments. What is a very interesting characteristic of what we call the new space movement, those vehicles and people that are doing things commercially in the private sector now, the, the different companies that are trying to build private rocket ships and carry people like yourself into space, is that it's more about people than governments. These are uh, independent companies acting sometimes in, with support of their government but oftentimes in spite of their governments to pursue their dreams in space. Those dreams are international. Those dreams know no borders. Uh, frankly, it is the laws that stop us from interacting with our friends and partners overseas that I think are one of the biggest impediments to opening the space frontier. Uh, there's a law called ITAR, which will not let me, an American, talk to my evil Canadian friends about how to build space components because somehow they're going to steal my knowledge and use it against us or sell it to Al-Qaeda or somebody evil. Well, what that does is it stops the flow of ideas. It stops the in natural interaction that occurs between creative and, and uh, intelligent people that leads to great things. Interestingly, from a national strategy point of view, if you want to look at it uh, 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 purely as a, an American who's trying to stop the expansion of, of technologies around the world so that we can control them, what you're doing by cutting people off from American technology is teaching them how to build their own. So you're really defeating yourself, even if it's that warped a perspective that you have. So it really doesn't work. Right now, uh, I think that it, it, it is one of the biggest impediments to opening space, this thing called ITAR. I call it uh, America's new iron curtain. It, it is the new wall and that wall, Mr. President, must come down.